Yeah, well, I think we can um, slowly get started. Um, we always have folks who end up joining, you know, one or two minutes after the, the start of the call. Um, well, good afternoon, or I should say good morning to those of you who are calling from the East Coast and good evening to those of you who are uh, a bit farther east than where I am in Brussels. Uh, my name is Christina Bage. I am the chair of our working group and I'm also an associate researcher at the Brussels School of Governance which is located at the Flemish speaking free university in Brussels. Um, and our call today is um, kind of divided into a few different sections as most of you on the call uh, would already know. Uh, Yi uh, Huang from Prime will give us a, a brief overview of the principles for responsible management education or Prime. And then I will tell us a little bit about our working group before um, giving the virtual microphone over to our guest speaker uh, today, Dr. Uh, Nikolai or Nick uh, Angelo. Um, and then we'll have, uh, hopefully have ample time for a um, open informal discussion about Nick's uh, work before wrapping things up. Uh, so Yi, if you could kindly um, tell us a little bit about Prime, we'd appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Christina, for your welcome. And welcome, Nick, to this webinar. Um, I prepared a little bit of slide to share with our audiences today. Um, so if you can see my slides right here. Hi, everyone. Warm welcome again to the um, uh, webinar organized by the Prime Working Group on Business for Peace. And I'm here for the contact person from the Prime Secretariat. It's my great pleasure to welcome you and also give a little bit introduction about Prime. So Prime, this uh, initiative of Prime is um, was organized was established in 2007 by an international task force of deans, university presidents, and different academic institutions. We are an United Nations sponsored initiative and a sister initiative of UN Global Compact, the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world. In terms of our race, we are proud to see to say that we are operating in 17. Uh, regional chapters right now and 99 countries. There are actually more than 870 signature schools in our big network. Um, and currently we have 47 champion schools who are, who are doing innovative movement and practices with prime secretaries. Last but not least, we have nine working groups these working groups are networks that are focusing on different SDG issues, like the working group um, on business for peace. These working groups, they are networks of professors, practitioners, teachers who would discuss together about different SDGs. The forms could be, for example, webinars that we, what we have today and also different research topics and different events. So um, don't hesitate to reach us if you have any questions about working groups. Now, I would like to hand over back to Christina and to start this webinar. Yeah, thanks so much, Yi. Um, for those of you who are new to our working group, um, I think only a few of you are actually new to our working group, uh, but we were started in 2014 by two academics, uh, Robert McNulty, uh, who at the time was at Bentley College, uh, and John Katsos, uh, who at the time and is still at American University of Sharjah. And the idea was um, to promote a, a more multidimensional understanding of peace within business and management education and um, to kind of further along this discussion and understanding on whether or not the private sector has an impact um, or role to play in um, either instigating social tensions um, or, or on the flip side, actually promoting a more multi-dimensional understanding of peace, which would look at both an absence of uh, personal or direct violence um, and as well as an absence of structural violence, um, such as inequality, injustices, um, inequity. Um, and um, our webinar today is, I suppose, as Yi said, is kind of our, um, let's say, flagship um, activity of our working group. We regularly organize um, discussions such as the one today, um, and also we invite um, fellow academics and practitioners um, to present 
either long-standing research or even uh, new ideas for, for uh, future research. Um, and I was particularly interested in inviting uh, Nick today uh, because I happened to come across um, his um, interventions in a piece on Al Jazeera that looked at um, the textiles industry, um, the impact of the textiles industry on local communities in Southeast Asia. And in keeping with our kind of, um, let's say, holistic understanding of peace or where we are also interested as a working group in looking at the nexus of the private sector and structural um, violence and, and um, positive peace, I thought it would be a good opportunity um, to invite Nick to share his work um, and also in the spirit of promoting more interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, collaboration uh, across fields. Um, so as you all, uh, saw in the invitation, um, Nick uh, will discuss his research on policy design efforts to transform the fashion industry from fast uh, to sustainable operations management. Um, he'll tell you a bit more um, in depth about his work. I don't want to necessarily repeat what we already have on, on, um, on the invitation, um, but just to say that um, uh, Nick, Dr. Angelov is an associate professor in the Department of Public Policy at the University of Massachusetts uh, in Dartmouth. Um, Dr. Angelov earned his PhD in policy studies uh, with a concentration on regional economic development, as well as an MPA and MS in applied economics and statistics uh, from Clemson University in 2012. Um, Nick will also, um, as far as I remember, also mention uh, two of his um, books that he's published. Um, and if you're also interested in seeing a bit more on, of Nick's work, um, he is has many uh, videos online that I've already checked out, uh, TEDx talk, including well, one of them being uh, a TEDx talk. So Nick, we're very delighted um, that you're with us today and uh, look forward to hearing uh, what you have to share with us. Well, thank you, Christina, for this great introduction. And um, I'm excited to share the research that I have been doing for like close to a decade now. Um, and it's still developing and it's growing tremendously. So I'm going to jump right into it so that we can have plenty of time for discussion. Um, and we're going to open with showing you uh, pretty much the <sighs> the trajectory of the research that it, it had developed. Um, in 2015, my first book came out, that's on the left, in which I was one of the uh, few voices at the time that was researching um, the sustainability and ecological and cultural impacts of the changing of the fashion industry from branded retail, as we call it, uh, to fast fashion, um, and since that time, uh, it seems that the issue grew so much in social attention and so much research was coming up on innovation to transform the industry, development of new materials, uh, better business practices, transparency, concepts like circularity became to emerge that um, it was time for a follow-up book, which I published last year. And um, now that books are already outdated. There's such innovation happening in the fashion industry. Okay, so it's not really outdated, but uh, there's new information that I have been working on, particularly on the policy and governance of the industries that I would like to share with you today. So a little bit of a background of what is included in this 10 years worth of work that is comprised now in two books is, is this change in the industry that um, happened just as the world was entering um, the global recession of 2008, all industrial sectors were contracting and the one that was expanding and not just expanding, but expanding exponentially was the apparel industry, which defies economic um, and business management principles of growth and contraction during recessions. So people started uh, asking questions of what is causing this growth and pretty much the growth was caused by technological innovation and product development of cheaper and more affordable and versatile textiles and the changing of business models towards fast fashion, which um, I don't want to waste your time. I'm assuming everybody knows what fast fashion is. Um, and we can go into a few examples of what that means in a second. 
but the issues, the sustainability issues that that folks were really concerned with is that the industry was becoming more and more dependent on petrochemical inputs. From the traditional fashion model, where when I was a fashion student, and we, even when I was writing the first book, I was quoting from a book in the early 2000s of what is fashion and what isn't fashion. And one of the lines in that book was like, you can't call it fashion if it's made out of polyester. We moved into now in the 2015s to the 2020s into a world that is almost entirely made out of polyester and man-made materials when it comes to what we wear. Um, so environmentalists were raising concerns from the high reliance on petrochemical inputs to the micro shedding clothes now being blamed as one of the leading causes of microplastics in the ocean. Um, and research after research was finding that the disreliance on polyester and on petro uh, blend materials and poly blends, as we call them, was accompanied by a very strong campaign of promoting the use of these materials with the promise that they are recycled, recyclable, uh, and there's innovations in chemical and mechanical recycling that allow for man-made materials to be recycled. Um, and, and research was becoming to emerge, has, be, has begun to emerge, I should say, in the last maybe uh, three years, maybe fewer than that, on uh, greenwashing. Um, greenwashing was barely mentioned five short years ago, and now we seems to be a, a major issue in corporate social responsibility, veracity, and uh, message distortion. So um, the reason why the messages are so divergent of what is happening in the industry and what the consumer hears from the industry and from governance bodies is because we live now in a world where apparel is bought digitally. So the commerce is based on four major sectors, as we call them in business, right? So you're business people, I'm going to speak business language here. So we have the fast fashion subsector of the industry. We have um, it's ugly, ugly child, the super fast fashion subsector that has emerged within the last not even 10 years, maybe five years. A um, few examples of brands, the fast fashion conglomerates that are getting a lot of the criticism and, and everybody is aware of H&M, Zara, ASOS, Topshop, Primark. But the super fast fashion brands that are emerging that are still evading uh, the scrutiny, although some people are beginning to, to, to raise concerns with their business models are Boohoo, Misguided, Pretty Little Things, Shane. Um, and even in the higher priced categories where branded retails, uh, the labels of the past, the Kelvin Kleins, the Donna Karens, uh, the Chanel's, well, that's luxury. Uh, the one, the branded retails that we know, the Lacoste that cost a little bit more, but had a cooler logo and it was seen as a little more prestigious are now being replaced by a, um, a subcategory called functional, uh, functional apparel and athleisure. Um, functional apparel is a little bit more technical in, in products, uh, but athleisure is the fastest growing subcategory where branding and prestige have merged to bring you um, brands like Uniqlo, Allo Yoga, Outdoor Voices, and, and other ones that are emerging really rapidly that are more expensive, almost twice as expensive as fast and super fast fashion pieces of clothing, uh, but are branded also in a much more versatile way. It was, it was uh, one of the definitions of athleisure is uh, clothes that you wear, um, that you can wear to exercise, but you wear for anything else but exercising. If you think about yoga pants of like 10 years ago that everybody was making fun of, now we live in them. So um, the, the, the way that these subcategories are growing in terms of retail is basically online. It is relied on a cons consumer behavior of digital purchasing that we call um, clickbait commerce, uh, where your average consumer is constantly shopping on smart devices. Um, the retail prices are so low that it's easy for the for the consumer to do it without suffering from what in retail for years we have called buyer's remorse, 
uh, when you're we're dealing with, with more expensive merchandise and the transaction cost of having to go to a store, evaluate options, make a choice under the stimulation of store environment, and you end up going home with a pair of $150 jeans, and then you go, oh my God, you sober up and you're like, what the hell did I just do? And then you go back in your return, and that's what's referred to as buyer remorse. Well, in these fluent, affordable digital platforms, buyer remorse is removed, so marginal purchasing is increased to the point that some psychologists are linking it to clinical addiction behavior. Um, and as much as we're talking about criticizing the industry and criticizing the big brands, I just wanted to, uh, I know Christina's going to laugh because we talked about um, the fact that I recently learned about Shane because it's not in the U.S. Uh, to the levels that I know, but I, I, I went and I got this graphic on the growth of that brand um, from its introduction in 2018 my, my second book came out in uh, 2021. I had not heard of it. Like it went into production in 2020. I did not even know. I was focused on Uniqlo at the time. Everybody was asking me if Uniqlo was evil. And I was saying, yes, Shane went, Sheen went completely under my radar and now is, is just taking over retail. And, and this, is, this is an example of this congruence of fashion advocacy on one on one end of the spectrum, raising issues on this business model of overconsumption, and then why is it that the public is not not only res not responding to it, but there are gaps in the market large enough to get multi-billion conglomerates to enter the market and compete with the fast fashion and the super fast fashion uh, brands out there. Never mind the branded retailers that are still very active and the luxury goods. So why is this happening? Well, this is happening, I think, and, and this is part of my ongoing research of the of the misinformation that the, the fashion industry is is bombarding the consumers with is because of the greenwashing promotion that is promising things that are not feasible yet, but nobody tells you that they're not feasible yet, right? The, the fashion industry is promising to do things even under the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and we're going to go over the actual political platforms that are actually helping greenwashing. But the major promises that are, I call them outright lies, that you hear every day as a, as a consumer of clothes is that the first one, the biggest one, that you can recycle your clothes. There's almost no technology that can recycle clothes back into clothes. There's only three entrepreneurs that came to market at scale just this calendar year that are making strides in that direction. But for about a decade, you have heard that you can recycle your clothes. You cannot recycle clothes. That is the one big lie, the same lie that the plastic industry has been peddling for half a century that we love to buy, that you can recycle plastics. You 8%, less than 8% of plastics are ever recycled. Technologically, it's infeasible and ecologically extremely taxing to recycle clothes and plastics. And But we love to hear that promise. So we keep on thinking that as long as we can put our clothes into a bin somewhere where it says recyclable, ecological damage is taken care of. Uh, the other big misinformation that we are told is that minimizing the waste will solve the problem. So that's why they're promoting recycling. Meanwhile, the, the integrated ecological uh, damage that is happening uh, as the largest carbon footprint, as we call it, in the industry is on the forefront, as in the production of clothes. Um, the promise of organic uh, it, it was another greenwashing that actually has fallen out of style because now everything is poly blend, so we don't really promote organic anymore. What we have started promoting now is bio blends, um, and that's, again, fairly recent from vegan leather praise that there's not it's not it's neither of that it's neither vegan nor leather discuss but you hear these promises out there there's so much misinformation that currently there are major lawsuits from governments and activist organization against the fashion brands to tell the truth and be transparent um so those are the outright lies then i also uh, include what we seeing in messaging and, and greenwashing messages what i call misleading messages which is that the industry is promising to work for in 
on. And this, these are promises. They're not happening, but they're repeated so often that the consumer is beginning to blur their understanding of this is a promise versus this is happening, that there's such a thing as carbon neutral operations and production. Uh, the term sustainability itself, uh, the Union for Concerned Researchers in Fashion that was launched in 2019 made a major motion at its platform to, to please be very cautious on how you use the term sustainability. Um, because it means different things to different people, and and it's a degree of improvement to, eco, towards ecological innovation that should be denoted in the way that sustainability is being used. And now it's a ubiquitous terms that everybody hides behind. Um, but the biggest issue is the mismatch of messaging uh, of the target market and the actual um, target market of sustainability messaging and the actual target market of the fashion industry. So um, all of this messaging is targeting us, the adults, but uh, the main market is tweens and teens um, that are relying on their own streams of user-generated media content and non-traditional advertising. Uh, when I was a fashion student and you, and you started at in any fashion school, intro to fashion, uh, FMM class was fashion management and merchandising. The first thing that you learn is that you live or die as a brand, as a company, as a designer by understanding the needs of your core demographic. Who is your core demographic? Females, 18 to 24. So that was, you know, fashion 101. Who's your core demographic? Females, 18 to 24. Now, fashion 101. Who's your core demographic? Doesn't matter if it's male or female, it's gender neutral, 12 to 16 year olds. They are the main demographic. They are the fashion decisions of their families. They're the ones that the industries turned into with the fast fashion business innovation, realizing one thing, that they have what the economists call inelastic consumption function. Why is that? Because they, particularly in the industrialized West, um, that's the demographic that is beginning to have its own money. And uh, it's it's uh, part of socialization and growth and independence is the use of that money, and they use ninety to one hundred percent of that money on clothes. So understanding that no recession, as the Great Recession of two thousand eight showed, uh, no economic downturn downturn will ever make a parent cut their child's clothing allowance allow the fashion industry to turn away from its main demographic that always has been their, their driving a customer in terms of marginal sales, females 18 to 24, to gender neutral 12 to 16 year old. And these kids don't wanna to listen to any of those messages. They don't understand the messages. Um, and they follow celebrity influencers who promote consumption and overconsumption in the brands of the cool labels in a way that uh, are proliferating this culture of the teenager becomes a digital brand. So as that's happening, what is happening in terms of governance? So our, your parent organization, the United Nations, has groups and subgroups of chapters. So under its framework of sustainable development goals, um, it launches the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It launches the Fashion Industries Charter for Climate Action in 2018. And this is what it actually does. It calls for the sector to reach green, greenhouse gas emission reductions by 30% by 2030. Um, that's in seven years. And it is signed or promise to work towards that goal by 40 plus, plus conglomerates, all the biggest brands in the world. Well, not Shane, because they didn't exist at the time. So, but what exactly does that mean when you sign a declaration like this? Well, what it means is, and this is directly from its legal platform, that uh, UNFCCC, under the UNFCCC, future legal frameworks for sustainability measurement and compliance will emerge. What does that mean? Nothing. It's a symbolic political manifestation of goodwill. That's why five years after the launch of this chat chapter, whatever it is that you want to call it, nothing is happening. Why is that? Well, because it's, it's politically and um, politically and governmentally not feasible. Um, 
you cannot tell corporations that operate in multiple markets across borders how to govern themselves and how to measure their compliance of something that doesn't uh, exist yet. So, um, but what can you do in countries where there's measurable platforms that you can use as legal precedent? Um, you can learn from these legal laws and try to have global trade agreements that incorporate their uh, specifics in order to have more countries sign into them. So the legal precedent on how to work towards a global system of compliance would be based on the REACH regulations of the European Union, which is uh, an overreaching law for the registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals, which operates under the European Chemical Agency um, throughout all European nations. So that is one supranational governance body that the UN can use as a platform to try to replicate, not just in Europe, but in Europe's tr major trading partners. In uh, countries that are heavily dependent on textiles, um, innovations towards regulation of pollution are emerging gradually, and that is the uh, zero liquid discharge uh, laws that are in, that have been implemented in parts of India in 2017, and the mandating of effluent treatment plants or the actual use of filtration systems in Bangladesh in 2020. So those are the, in terms of laws to regulate ecological impact of fashion, those are the only ones. There's no such laws in the US. Uh, the Clean Water Act, maybe with some regulations in terms of volume, um, regulates a, a total daily discharge of, of effluents, but in terms of waste management and in terms of um, uh, uh, integrated systemic governance of pollution mitigation, the REACH regulations and uh, uh, ZLD and ETF laws in Southeast Asia are the legal precedents which the UN can work on. So um, when it comes to the actual design of these policies, they actually were created not by governments, but by consultancies. Um, those consultancies are, again, um, they operate as a supranational body with authority, but they're really not. They're a voluntary membership platform in which you become a member, you pay a membership fee, and um, and then you use their services if you want to. So um, they're moving into consultancy niches, such as Ecotex is, is focused on consumer safety um, and the chemical regulation of uh, inputs into clothes manufacturing that can leach onto the consumer. Uh, Go Blue is a chemical app that textile manufacturers can use in their dyeing and finishing products to track how much dye they're uh, discharging in their um, daily operations and what dyes they're using so that they can say to future um, uh, clients who are who care about having and implementing another innovation environmental scorecards that they're using better dyes, natural dyes, high fixation dyes. Um, and that way that that's a branding for them to, to be more competitive with other textile mills. Um, and the Higg index, which is a set of uh, self assessment tools. Um, and although fashion manufacturers, I can, I get into detail into this. I don't want to bore you on this are using these consultancies, they're creating a system of capture where transparency issues are a problem. And that's why now we have, uh, I'm working on a paper that is tracking the uh, lawsuits against the misleading sustainability uh, veracity claims and certification claims of the major brands. Um, uh, they're ongoing in Europe and Sweden. One just launched in Australia and two lawsuits were launched in the US, but they were settled out of court. Um, so to move on to where we stand in terms of policy design, the policy design efforts are, as I said before, a problem of putting the cart before the horse. We want to reach sustainability, but the technologies that we need are not there. So the policies that we need for regulation are also not there. 
So as the United Nations, which is a, um, it does not, ha- it, 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 it's, a, it's a body of government, of governance agreement, as UN member states agree to collaborate with each other, the UN as, a, as an institution itself does not have the power to oversee and regulate the governance of individual of its member states. So what can it do? Well, it, the only thing it can do is to ask its member states to create laws um, around the development, uh, the U.S. Sustainable Development Goals for better fashion. So it says, these are our goals. Hey, politicians and individual nations, could you please introduce in your state houses and your senates bills that can do this and this and this? So, so far, what has happened? Uh, France has patched such bills. Um, one is the banning of insult clothes. Uh, one is for the mandating of... Um, um, I have to move this so that I can read what I've put down. Oh, carbon labels on clothing, which is really going to be interesting. That's not going to come into effect for quite a while. Um, in the United States, New York State has the fashion law that is right now being introduced in the state house, but has not cleared um, enough support to move to the Senate. Um, California is proposing a similar law with the banning of, um, with the mandating of recycling of clothes. And I just got asked two days ago to give an interview on what I think about that law. Um, and um, so, so these are the only legal uh, movements, legal actions that are happening that you're hearing are out there to change an industry that is based on global value chain commerce, independent contractors in three different tiers, the most internationalized production function where the yarn comes from one place, then it's woven, uh, I'm sorry, the the, the um, raw material, whether it's polyester pulp or cotton comes from one place, then it's woven into yarn under different jurisdiction, then it's dyed and finished under a third jurisdiction, then it's assembled under fourth, oftentimes shipped repeatedly across borders, uh, then retail and distribution happens in a completely different place. So when you're working in that kind of a global value chain, where one of the, um, one of my um, graphics comes from a um, a paper by European sustainability fashion researchers um, with Kirsi Niemaki out of Alta University being the, the first author. And they show when they track global value chains and clothes sold in Europe that 80% of the clothes sold in Europe are mainly manufactured outside of the European Union and partially finished within Europe. How do you regulate where that production of 80% of the value added um, links and components happens. Um, So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of coming up with what is going to be a carbon label for clothing. Um, A lot of promises on the forefront about recycling. And as we said, as I said before, and I can answer more specific questions during the discussion, at this point, recycling is possibly more carbon intensive than not recycling. And we don't want to think about that because we want to incentivize the development of better technologies and they are coming to market and growing at scale. So you want to promote recycling without really telling the truth that currently technology doesn't allow for that to happen efficiently. So um, I can answer questions. I would like to stop right here before I really... um, uh depress you <laughs> somebody said to me that i was very depressing in my presentations and open it up for discussion yeah that's great nick thank you so much i mean it's uh such i mean you, you provide us with a wealth of information i think you know sometimes when I, i'm meeting with uh, my students they feel a bit overwhelmed in terms of um they they have they struggle with how to actually let's say contribute to societies uh, in a way that is positive. Um, and these are B-school students even sometimes. So they, they, they feel overwhelmed. They, they see these global issues and you know the whole idea of sustainability. It seems like they seem like really big concepts and they, they do struggle sometimes um, 
seeing entry points for them as professionals or entry points even for business to to address yeah these different global concerns that we're all interested in but i think what you present to us it's um it's yeah maybe you you may feel so or sometimes maybe people feel like your presentations are all about gloom and doom but i actually think that it's it's a very personal way of of um contributing to society in a positive way i mean you know textiles clothes i mean we we all wear them i mean it it's it, it kind of brings this this um issue down to a personal scale and it's about personal choice um you know as a, as consumers um so i particularly appreciate your work, uh, and I don't think it's all gloom and doom. I think it's actually very digestible for us uh, to understand how we can contribute to society in a positive manner. What I do think is also interesting is you, we talked also about how um, there's this you know wave of environmental and human rights due diligence um, on the horizon, at least within the EU uh, on the EU landscape. I mean, I think it would be interesting also to hear a little bit about. Um, your thoughts on whether or not there could be a knock-on effect in developing economies or in fragile and conflict-affected environments um, where maybe companies aren't necessarily only looking at it from um, a do no harm approach, but trying to actually uh, see potential entry points for them to impact societies in a positive manner. So not only from, yeah, this do no harm or uh, regulatory approach, but could those regulatory mechanisms sort of help the private sector transform their understanding in, in being able to, or even have the desire to, to uh, impact communities in a positive manner? It's complicated and, and, and yet it's frightfully simple. Um, it has to do with corporate ownership. Um, and, and the corporate ownership of the conglomerates and the entities that we see as a brand and, and actually understanding what is it that they own. So unfortunately, we have moved away from a vertically integrated business entity into a uh, born global format of branding. Where, and that and that's been going on for decades. When I started working in the industries, I first worked for Federated, which is the parent company of Macy's, and work with subcontractors and suppliers. Then I moved in for Liz Claiborne. And one of the first things I learned at Liz Claiborne is that the company owns no factories. H&M owns no factories, right? They all rely on suppliers and subcontractors. The problem with the suppliers and subcontractor groups, as they're called, is that they are exclusively in the developing world. They are in, in countries where regulatory environments allow for the production of such things as viscose, which is outlawed. It's outlawed in the West, but it's one of the fastest growing poly blend and recycled material um, um, input now turn into yarn, right? Uh, there's no water regulatory uh, platforms in terms of effluent treatments. That's why you saw my Bangladesh and India in the last few years are actually introducing laws. They had no laws before. The problem there is that the owners of these groups are also members of the political elites. So it's it's a complete capture of regulatory oversight where you as a Western brand says, I want transparency, I want regulatory compliance, I want you factory in Bangladesh to um, not collapse like Rana Plaza, right? And, and kill people. But when um, the zoning and building inspector entity is the same person that owns the actual textile farm, capture is politically is is the political status quo and it's very uncomfortable in a governance platform to have these conversations because then if they're western initiated the blame emerges as this is business imperialism you're telling me how to govern myself you're telling me how to um, make my own laws here to comply with you in a country that you don't understand our standards. And 
all we can do at this point is raise more issues of the fact that the transparency is asked in the retail markets, but it's not the incentive to implement it in the sourcing markets, as we call it, is not there because the local politicians don't want it to happen. One of the documentaries that was tracking the sustainability collection launched by H&M uh, from Art um, uh, Movie Studio in France and was looking at the actual buildings and zoning codes in Bangladesh in terms of safety regulation and effluent treatments and and you can see i mean the government had armed guards like from the local government shooing away the journalists that were looking at the colored effluents going into a schoolyard if the local government much rather see toxic ways going into a schoolyard where seven-year-olds barefoot are playing in the toxic effluents what power do we have to tell them to care about those seven-year-olds' public health, right? So the priorities are now not discussed honestly. The priorities are poverty alleviation in the global South, lifting people out of poverty, economic development, attracting investment, making business. Um, COVID scared the entire industry in terms of negatively impacting the most vulnerable workers and the most vulnerable governments by contracting. So nobody wants to talk about contraction. Everybody wants to talk about expansion and, and more business going over there. So the regulatory uh, in terms of ecological monitoring and compliance challenges are still not honestly being addressed. And everything is swept under the rug with this whole just recycle. Just the, as long as you mandate recycling and put your clothes over there, then you don't have to worry about anything else. Yeah, that's a lot to take in. And not in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. I, does anybody else have any comments or questions? Yeah, please, Vinahan, jump in there. Don't don't wait. Hi, everyone. Nikolai, uh, it's amazing uh, what you are working with. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you to put a little bit more about it is the initiative uh, initiatives um, nature based initiatives to promote the um, uh, a, a more sustainable affordable and more um, uh, I, I don't know how can I say but uh, something that we can monitor better in terms of uh, asset management. Uh, since the beginning of the idealization of the product, uh, how is the scenario uh, that you are looking at into this uh, kind of initiatives? Because it's so important to think about something that will be reusable or yes. will last yes, um, yes. In, the, in, the, in the very uh, yes. beginning so of the process. I, I will actually type in a, a, a few things. And again, these are so new that they're now just being announced. Um, so um, as, as I, I mentioned before, uh, for, for a few years, people have been talking about bio blends or um, um, clothes being made with uh, mushroom inputs and eucalyptus wood pulps. That's really viscose. So um, they have been gaining a lot of, of popularity as, oh, at least they contain a natural input. Um, but unfortunately, that th there's a double-edged sword. Yes, they, they have a natural input in them, but in order to bind the pulp together and turn it into a viscose, you have to use plastic. You have to use polymers, which is plastic derived. So you make it into a form of polyester, really, whether it contains wood chips versus cotton, it's still a poly blend. But within the last 48 months, really, because when I gave the TEDx talk, I talked to the CEO of the company who I met two years ago and he was still getting uh, funding to launch it. Now at scale is operating uh, new fiber welding. And they make now yarn and what looks like pleather that is completely plant-based. 
no petroleum derivatives whatsoever. So they make it from grasses and plants. Uh, the guy is an organic chemist who launched it. Now they're they're um, announcing initiatives with the major brands, uh, including Zara. And there is product now, shoes, accessories, outerwear that is made with um, Claris is their material and is completely plant-based. In terms of actual recycling, um, uh, Blocktex. Out of Australia and ever new out of Seattle, again, just this year, have pioneered a way to actually recycle bioblends. Prior to 2022, you couldn't recycle bioblends. You could chemically recycle polyester. And, and when I used to say in, in prior presentations that you can recycle polyester, the chair of the chemistry and biochemistry department at my school would yell at me, don't say that. I'm like, but you can't, I read it. He's like, well, if you, if you consider putting clothes in toxic vats of sludge to be good for the environment, then yes, say that you can chemically recycle polyester. You could recycle it, but it's very toxic and very energy inefficient to do, which is, is probably twice as cheap and, and takes less energy to make new polyester than to recycle polyester. Should we be recycling it? Absolutely. Should we be looking for better ways to do it? Absolutely. But if it's economically inviable, then and and that would jack up the prices of a product made with recycled polyester. Is it still done? Yes. Are the luxury brands introducing product lines where they say, oh, this is done with recycled polyester, or this coat is done uh, with, with reclaimed, whatever it is that they're calling it these days, but all petrochemical materials. Um, Innovations are happening. One of the journals that I've, I'm a public policy person, started an IR. I now read the Journal of Cleaner Production, like is my main academic journal, because I'm learning all about reverse osmosis, desalinization in terms of treating effluents, natural dyes, mordants, lab-based innovations that can use bacteria to dye clothes versus indigo. All of that attention now is happening because of the activism that we have put on the fact that this is an extremely toxic subsect subsector. And it's not just that it is an extremely toxic subsector, but it is introducing a business model uh, based on what in business we call creative destruction, rapid replacement creative destruction that is being replicated in other fast moving consumer goods. How old is your smartphone? right? What is this business model of having to have a new smartphone every six months? Do we stop to think in terms of this rapid consumption, this rapid rate of innovation and new consumption, what that is doing now to e-waste as now uh, calls are being made to talk about e-waste, the capturing of e-waste, recycling of e-waste, the reliance on such inputs as rare earths that are very specific in terms of location of where they come from. Most likely there's uranium from North Korea in your smartphone, you don't know it. But if you did, would you buy a new one every six months? So when it comes to corporate social responsibility and that business for peace and business for human rights space that Christina and I talked about, understanding the intricacies of these global value chain productions in terms of innovation and scientific advancement and capabilities is essential because it is so easy in a policy rhetoric to talk about something that is subject to interpretation in a large component. Meanwhile, the innovators like New Fiber Welding, Blocktex, Evernew, when I talked to, to, to their and they were such, they were startups when I first heard of them, right? And I would reach out to them and say, I'm so-and-so and blah, blah, blah. Can I use my platform to help you promote, blah, blah, blah. And they have to compete. They have to compete with Shane for clients, right? They have to compete for market share. Um, one of the major consultancies that was guiding the first sustainability uh, transparency efforts of the industry um, Eco, no, not eco. Yeah, did Ecotex go out of business? One of them went out of business. It was the only one before 
um, the Hig Index, and it was global. It operated globally, and and reason why I know they went out of business is because they contacted me to work on a grant and be part of a series of talks. And next thing I know, we get, I'm sorry, we're filing for bankruptcy notice, right? They couldn't get enough brands to sign up for their business to be their clients so that they can stay afloat. So it's still very turbulent market if we want to talk about business practices here. It is still very hard to enter this market as an innovator and to compete for business and clients. So the innovators that are that are pioneering new technology that is producing product, but the product might carry a markup, they're having a rough time. So it's essential. I, I try to always promote their name. So I'll say, go to New Fiber Welding's website, see where you can find Claris. You want to, you know, you want to support them with your dollars, support them with your dollars. Uh, Evernew and, and BlockTex are just announcing their partnerships with brands that will use their reclaimed material. Uh, and this is all very exciting because I, I, I get to say this now in this presentation. I wasn't able to say this a year ago in presentations. Christina, thank you again, Dr. Christina. And uh, Dr. Nikolai, thank you for your presentation and your words. Yeah, um, and I think we have space, a lot of space to work science to create molecules that could be uh, break uh, in, into something that we can manage in our environment too, not only to create good um, investments for us, um, customers, but uh, something that we can manage and use in our favor. Thank you so much and congratulations for your beautiful work. Thank you. Yeah, anybody else have some thoughts? Um, I just want to say that, uh, first off, thank you so much. I learned a lot in your presentation, and I am currently in a sustainability management program at Columbia, and I'm excited to share these companies and resources that you've mentioned in the chat with them, because I think it'll bring a lot of uh, excitement and hope to my colleagues and peers um, because you know I am part of the generation that's kind of like okay well where am I supposed to buy my clothes because everyone is only shopping at Sheen and Zara and I don't want to be a part of that so it's really cool to hear about the developments and the advancements in the space so uh, yeah. you you say that you were called doom and gloom in the past but I'm leaving very hopeful <laughs> there is such there, it's so great to see that in such a short period of time that you are now in a degree in sustainable operations right now when I was writing the first book and I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology my alma mater when I was an undergraduate and I said hey for my doctorate I'm gonna take on this project that was 2009 and I, the concept of sustainability was beginning to bubble up and the chair of the department looked at me and she said competitions on price. I mean, she pretty much said, don't bother. Like we're really interested in supply chain management and international trade. That's my degree. They teach you how to enter the, the industry and outsourcing and product positioning for global branding, global markets. There was no, there was no other alternative. There was no sustainable fashion courses even. Now there's entire programs in sustainable fashion design, sustainable fashion operations at the graduate level. There's partnerships, there's funding. Um, read my stuff if you want for, for more details on what's emerging. But every day I hear wonderful things like the European Union is funding this startup that is proposing to capture you know, um, carbon emissions with this technology. Now we're aware of micro shedding and we were not aware of micro shedding a few years ago. Now we're developing better technologies to stop that. So the fact that we are honestly discussing the need for entrepreneurship is what's so hopeful because within one short year, we have three large at scale uh, global, they will be global corporations. I think that uh, ever new is setting up a system of factories in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and they're building up their European branch in Spain. So within the next five years, you will be able to places like Target, find clothes made with Claris, shoes made with 
and they have, I, I don't remember all the names, but Claris is one that I know because I, I know that I can find something made with it. But now uh, New Fiber Welding has three different products out there. One is in uh, what looks like leather. So for wallets, outerwear, shoes, one is for active wear clothing. So it looks like, it looks and feels like maybe Under Armour, thicker kind of polyester. It's, it looks, it feels like polyester, but it's not polyester, right? It's made out of plant-based materials. It's all done with natural dyes. Um, and it's so hopeful to see that these folks are putting product out there. Is it expensive? Yeah. Will it be expensive for a while? Yeah. Are they promoting what Timo is calling degrowth? Uh, a business is based on degrowth, so not expanding rapidly, but operating within sustainable limits within maybe will not, we will not grow exponentially, but we will grow to the point where we can be profitable and employ a certain amount of people and provide good product. Um, this is something that we also need to, to talk about because if that happens, if that business model of degrowth actually takes hold and companies like uh, Patagonia and um, mm, Eileen Fisher promise not to grow anymore. That will allow for other innovators to enter the markets and they won't all be shame. They'll be the new fiber welding folks and they'll be the folks that we will support. But we first we need to know that are there, right? As, as, as you were saying, Sienna, you didn't know about these brands. Right. Unless you want to go on the Internet and do very targeted searches, you will never know that Claris is out there and you can purchase clothes made with it. So I'm here beating the drum, spreading the news. Hopefully you all are going to put this on media so that we can spread it, spread the news more. Uh, and we're talking to our students and we're educating them more and research is, is developing and it's very hopeful to see. Uh, the academic community across disciplines mm -hmm. respond to this social uh, issue because, as, as I said, it's just one industry. But our entire industrial makeup is is based on um, carbon intensive production and consumption. So starting in one place that's ubiquitous, which is clothing, moving into smart devices, electronics, um, to automobiles and energy appliances is how we're moving into this carbon neutral economy. Wow, that's fantastic, Nick. I mean, thank you so much. I am definitely leaving feeling informed. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's just incredible. <laughs> well, I mean, congratulations to all of your work. Thank you so much for you know offering your time to us. Uh, for sure, we I, we will um, share the recording of the webinar on our social media, and we'll disseminate it um, to the other working groups and to, of course, our our members as well. Uh, we welcome you to do the same, and we really welcome you to to stay connected with us, Nick. Hopefully, we can uh, find some ways uh, to uh, let's say integrate you into maybe some of the other working groups um, that Prime has as well. I think there are a lot of uh, opportunities for crossover. Um, so beyond going beyond our, our working group on business for peace. Absolutely. But, Thank um, you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nick. Thanks for everybody else for joining and, and, uh, yeah, please stay tuned for, for, for what's next on, on our horizon as a working group. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. E. Thanks, Ian. Bye. Bye, Renhan. Bye. Bye, Sastri.